everybody had a great Thanksgiving. Yes, yay, everybody had a good Thanksgiving? Get a lot of turkey, a lot of whatever kind of food that you eat on Thanksgiving. Anybody do sauerkraut? No, nobody has sauerkraut for Thanksgiving? My goodness, wow. Well, welcome, welcome to our worship service this morning. If there's online as well, we welcome you. We're glad you're with us this morning. Well, this is a season of Christmas and of Advent, and there's a lot going on to help us celebrate um, the Advent season, the Christmas season, help, hopefully to keep our eyes on uh, Christ, who is our, our hope, our love, our joy, and our peace. So just a reminder, we have these great devotionals that you can find in the North X. We encourage you as a couple, as individual, as families, as young adults, uh, wherever you are in your stage of life, may do it with someone else even. We have these Advent um, kind of called the Eternal King Arrives, a great way to just connect and, and really learn the lessons of the Advent season. As well, we have an all-night prayer visual to prepare us for the Advent season. That is this Friday, beginning at 8 o'clock, and it will go through Saturday morning to 8 a.m. So if you uh, want to uh, come in any part of that, we would love to have you. I think the young adults are going to kick us off on the 8 o'clock hour. I think I signed up for the 12 o'clock hour to lead, but um, we would love for you to enjoy us and join us and to pray and to seek the Lord together this Advent season. Also, we have a men's event also next, two, next Saturday um, for breakfast. That's at 8 o'clock um, to 1030. And then a woman's Christmas party the following week. Um, that's at 7 at night to 9 p.m. Also, another show and tell, we have poinsettias to, uh, if you're interested in buying uh, poinsettia and to, to display here in our sanctuary, um, there are, again, these red cards back in the North X. Please pick one up. We'll make the announcement this week and next week, but next week is the last uh, Sunday that you can order them, so please take advantage of getting the poinsettias. And then we're going to be decorating for Christmas uh, next uh, Saturday from 12 to 2. Is that correct, Michelle? So if you love to decorate for Christmas, come and join us at 10 to 2. With that in mind, I think that's all the announcements. Thea, if you want to come and lead us in worship. Good morning, church. For the church gathered here and online, let's take a moment to reflect and be grateful to God for the great things he has done for us, he's doing for us, and will be doing for us, not only in this world, but in the next as well. Please stand as we begin our worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his people. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Together in spirit. 
O triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how it is so good, it is so very good to be in the house of your Lord, to be in your house, to worship you this morning, to honor you with our words and our lives and our worship, to, to thank you and to praise you for all that you've given us in Jesus Christ. We are yours forever, eternally. Father, we are your very precious children all through the work of Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit makes that known to us so that we can come here this morning as a united household of God to worship you, to bless you, to seek you, to be changed by you. So Lord, bless this worship this morning. May you be glorified in all aspects of it. And we ask this in the name of Christ. Amen.
Thank you. Please be seated. As we continue our worship, let's turn our minds, our eyes to the cross, because it's at the cross that we receive the greatest gift ever given. And we enter into the gates of heaven and access the gift of grace only through the confession of our sins. So let's take a moment and confess our, our, our sins together and then take a short moment to individually confess our sins. Merciful God, during this season of Thanksgiving, we acknowledge of the blessings and gifts you grant us each day. In losing sight of your gifts, we lose sight of you. In doing so, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. But and what we have left undone. We get busy with our lives, a wonderful gift from you, and we forget to love you with our whole being. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Merciful Father, by your precious Holy Spirit, lead us into your path of righteousness so that we may be truly grateful for all you have given us. Amen. Please stand for the assurance of pardon. In him, we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks. Amen. Let's confess us our faith together. I believe in God, Almighty Father, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. It's now time for offering. And once again, the greatest gift we ever received was the gift of the cross, for Jesus died for us. So in giving, we're simply offering a small token in gratitude to the greatest gift that we ever receive. The ushers may come along.
Almighty Jesus, Almighty God, accept these humble gifts that we offer to you and through you to this church so that the good news may be preached here and to the far ends of the world. We say all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. We just uh, offer prayer for the children and then they will be dismissed. Somebody's waiting for them at the back. Dear Lord, once again, your gift of love has offered us these children, for the children are the greatest gifts in our lives. Children learn to honor God, to love God, and to love each other, for it's in loving that you'll be fulfilled in your lives. We also ask that we continue to love our children as God has loved us, and guide them because as Jesus Christ taught us, unless we become like them, the gates of heaven will be far from us. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Nobody really eats sauerkraut for Thanksgiving, <laughs> but my family. That's interesting to me. <laughs> it's always, you know, things that kind of, it is a Maryland thing. And anybody from Maryland? <laughs> That's true. That is true. Well, the last three weeks, we have seen how God has given us these spirit-giving blessings that the Father purposed us to have these blessings, uh, that Jesus accomplished those blessings for us, and then we see the Holy Spirit giving us these blessings in a beautiful way. In fact, Paul praises God, blesses God for these spiritual blessings. Now we come to this section in, in, in Ephesians uh, 15 through 23, and we see that Paul is praying to the same triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He's praying that these blessings would take deep root into our souls, into our hearts. That not only do we under know the grace, but that we would experience more of that grace that he has provided for us in these spiritual blessings. So follow along as I read from chapter 1 of Ephesians, verses 15 through 23. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, and that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of our hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? What is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father God, as again, as we gather around your word this morning, may the meditations of our hearts, may the, the words that, were, that are spoken today would bring glory and honor. Holy Spirit, do your work of pressing on these beautiful spiritual blessings in such a way that it renews us and, and encourages us and changes us 
to live more and more out of this reality that we have and all that we have in Christ. Do that work this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me ask you a question. What does your Christian life look like? What does your Christian life look like? Is it filled with praise? Is it filled with prayer? Is it filled with hope? Is it filled with power? Or is it filled with discontentment? Or busyness? Or hopelessness? Or failure? Or complacency? Or maybe it's in between all of those, right? Many of us may be experiencing hope but yet also are feeling a sense of hopelessness. Many of us may say, yeah, we're content in the Lord, yet there's still something that that in our hearts that we're feeling discontent about. What What does your Christian life look like? Do we look at these blessings that we have looked at the last three weeks in detail and say, that is not enough. I need more of you, God. I need more blessing. I need more of, I need more of things than what these things promise. Or are you in between, or are you saying that, yeah, these blessings are very cool, but they, they don't seem like I, that's enough. I need more things in this life. Where are you this morning? What does your Christian life look like? Are you basking in these spiritual blessings? Why am I asking that question? Because I believe that Paul is praying in this, this prayer that these spiritual blessings that we have in Christ would fall more and more deeply into our hearts, that we not only know about them, but that we would experience them in how we live as a Christian. So this morning, we're going to look at those prayers that he prays for the church, the first things he prays about. But before we do that, I want us to look at verses 15 and 16, because he shows us that it's good to give thanks to the triune God For he says this, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. Now this Thanksgiving season, we we gathered around with family and friends, and we probably, at many of these tables, went around the table and asked what we were thankful for. We're thankful for our health. We're thankful for our jobs. We're thankful for our friendships and our family. But here we see, what is Paul thankful for in verse 15, he's thankful first for the faith of those in Jesus. He's thankful for the church's faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is highlighting their faith in Christ, especially since they're living in a very adulterous culture of paganism and multi gods. So remember, they're a minority in a, in a culture and in a, in a city that was worshiping Diana. They're, they're involved in the occult, and so all of this is going on. And, and so Paul sees the church being faithful, being living out their faith in Christ. And so he thanks God for their faith in Christ. He commends them for their faith. He commends them for relying on Jesus for their provision and for living for God's glory in the midst of a very lost and messy culture in which they lived. He's thankful that God has grabbed their hearts in such a way and that by his grace they're living out their faith in a challenging environment. But not only is he thankful for their faith in Jesus, he's thankful for their love towards one another. He's he's thankful for the love towards believers. Remember, this is an international church made up both of Jewish and Gentile believers from various nations. And Paul sees them attempting to love across cultural barriers without discrimination or resentment. The church's love for the saints unites them with each other amid this adulterous culture. And he sees their love for one another, supporting one another, encouraging one another, providing strength for one another, helping them to live differently in a world in which says, no, you need to be worshiping other things other than the triune God. Now, we know that they don't love perfectly, that their faith isn't perfect, for for we see later on that Paul exhorts them that they need to overcome some barriers to unity, that they need instructions on how to love in all aspects of their life, in their family, work, and family. Nonetheless, Paul sees them in Christ. Yes, and perfect, still in process, yet not yet arrived, but nonetheless robed with all the Spirit-given blessings 
that they have in Christ. These are saints chosen by God, adopted into his family, full of grace, forgiven, redeemed, reconciled, united, and of God's inheritance. And so Paul thanks the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that they are expressing a growing faith in Christ Jesus and an act of love for one another. We can learn from Paul. We, too, live more and more in a world that is in chaos, that seems so anti-Christian, especially in the rest, a culture that, culture that more and more denies Jesus and his teachings. And the Christian faith and love is showing forth, but at times it is tested. We are tempted to give in. We learn from Paul to give thanks to God for the fruit of the spirit that we can see in one another. We know that it's yes to mature, but we want to thank God for what God, what God is doing in each of our lives. We're a church made, of, made up of many nations, and we want to commend one another when we see God at work in one another's lives. We want to, we want to encourage them to keep on going, so we give thanks for those in our lives, no matter where they are in their journey, no matter how mature or immature that they are. We want to give thanks to God personally for those people who are living out their faith that are showing love to one another. You see, in these verses, Paul encourages us to see the good that God is doing in a person's life and let them know about it. Paul let the church know how thankful he was for them. See, we don't usually grow in an environment where our sins and failings are seen and remembered. Yes, we grow in an environment Yes, that we know that we are sinners, but we also know that God is at work to make us more and more like Jesus. That's what the spiritual promises, the blessings remind us, that God is at work to provide all that we need to live a life of grace and of godliness. So as I think about this section where Paul is saying, thank you for those of, that are living out their faith, those who are loving well, who is, a, who is that person that you want to give thanks to? That friend who's maybe struggling in her faith yet shows acts of con kindness. Maybe send a note saying, it's good to see your faith being expressed in that way. Or a young, unpolished, new believer bearing witness of Christ in a hostile environment. Or a tired or wearied spouse bearing witness of Jesus in a um, and showing love, selfless love to their children. Our burdened brother or sister in Christ faithfully teaching young people about Jesus. Our Christian father or mother who has perfectly mentored you in your life. Who in the, who in the church here can you show thanks, give thanks for to God and to let them know that you're thanking God for them? I consider with embarrassment my many mistakes and failures over the three decades of ministry, both in volunteer leadership or in pastoral ministry or in leading a counseling ministry. I'm thankful for those who are willing to look past my immaturity, my failures and sins to help me grow in the grace of Christ that God intends to surround and support our growth in him. Who can you say thankful, who can you say thank you to God in your life and in the life of this church? I encourage you to do that. But God then, Paul then moves to giving thanks to the triune God for the believers in Ephesus to now praying for them in a powerful way. So let's first look at these first requests of Paul. We see that he first prays that they receive a spirit of wisdom and revelation. Look at verses 17 and 18, the first part. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of glory, may fill you with the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Paul first prays to receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Paul knows that the deepest longings and the greatest needs of believers are spiritual. So Paul prays for spiritual wisdom, spiritual discernment, spiritual insight. 
Now, I'm going to state the obvious. We don't see everything clearly. Amen? (laughs) So Paul prays that the church in Ephesus will see the spiritual reality that is not apparent to ordinary sight. Paul wants the believers to be sensitive to the work of the Holy Spirit to help them make sense of the blessings that God had given them and are available to them through the ministry of the church. Paul prays that God would give knowledge of God himself to his beloved people. See, wisdom and knowledge are a gift, God's gift to his children. So we pray that God would make himself known to his people. Praying for God to act is only half the prayer needed for the spiritual mature, the spiritual nurture of God's people. We must pray that our hearts be, be receptive to God's gift of wisdom and knowledge. By praying this way, Paul recognizes the need of God's sovereign intervention and petitions him to act on behalf of his people by opening their heart to see divine truth. Spiritual wisdom and insight is coming from the truth of God's word. If you want wisdom, you want spiritual insight, it comes from the word of God. It comes from knowing God through his word, through his creation. See, Paul knows that spiritual needs of God's people are profound and deep. So he he prays that the eyes of our hearts, I love the two combination, the eyes of our hearts be opened so that we could see the provision that God has made available to our care. Paul says Old Testament language when he says enlighten, for the spiritual understanding comes to believer at heart, at the heart level. God is saying, may our hearts see the truth of God's word. And as we see the truth of God's word, then we, then we will wisely live before a world that needs to see the grace and righteousness of Christ. Friends, we are all in need of God's wisdom and knowledge as it relates to living out his truth in our lives. We need our hearts enlightened to live in a biblical way. So the question for us, are we seeking his wisdom and spiritual insight as you live in a world that struggles with God's truth? Are you considering his ways and what he says in his word, the Bible, about the character of God, about salvation, about who Jesus is and what he's done, on how to love others, how to forgive, how to communicate to one another, how to live in a marriage how to reconcile with another believer, how to work. Are we praying that these truth penetrates your own heart, but also the heart of others within this church in our service to God? May we pray for the spiritual wisdom and insight that we might fully know God more deeply as we look at his word. May we pray that for one another, and may we expect God to change us more and more into a community that shows forth his glory and praise. But he doesn't stop there. He then goes on to pray that we would know and experience the hope of God's call. Look at the second part of verse 18. He says that you, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Let me ask, what is the hope in which God has called us? We've experienced this for the last three weeks. As Paul describes the work of God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit, he has pointed out our hope. We sang about that hope earlier in one of those hymns. All creation is the Lord and we are his beloved children forever in Christ. The universe is not random and we are never abandoned in Christ. Our God is just and gracious. He is sovereign, and he is saving. We are in Christ. This is the church hope. It is our hope. This is the opposite of what the world thinks of hope. They have a lack of hope. The musical group Vertical Horizon, anybody heard of that group? It's a a group that started out of Washington, D.C., a bunch of students from Georgetown University. They're, They're now an alternate rock group. Listen to what they say about their lack of hope and the lines upon your face. They say this, Sometimes I wish that we were immortal, 
and the game of life always had an happy ending. But I know it's not true. According to them, life does not have a happy ending. My, but my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, for a Christian, we do have a happy ending. The truth of the gospel is that we are going to spend eternity with God. And those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ and the God who controls this world, there is a very happy ending always, always. Dr. Chapel explains, he says this, there is an end of futility, the realization that the world is not senseless and that your sin is not endless in consequence or compulsion. The, there is a purpose to the world, pardon for sin, power over it provided by God. God who provides each of these has called you as a father, calls a beloved child out of darkness into his marvelous light. You see, my friends in Christ, there is a hope that the Apostle Paul prays, that we are called to pray for that same hope that the, that the church and ourselves will experience. Do pray for that hope to resonate in our hearts so that we live in this world, how tragic it can be at times, how hard it can be at times to live, and, and, and difficulties that we have in our relationships. We have a hope like no other. We have a hope that we are in Christ and that we will spend eternity with him forever and ever. Paul then adds to his prayer that we know and experience the glory of God's inheritance in that last section in verse 18. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? He's praying that, that we would experience that, that, that not only that we understand that, we're, that we are God's inheritance, but that, that we would experience and be encouraged and motivated by being God's inheritance. Again, we, I talked a little bit that there is a, a different ways to look at that is that the glorious inheritance in the saints. Is it an inheritance that God provides to his people or whether his people are being counted as his inheritance? Last week, I told you that I favored the latter, that, that God actually considers us his inheritance. He has promised blessing to himself. Again, I remind you that we should be awed and, and wowed and astonished by such a beautiful gift of grace. We see in other places that, that God rejoices over us with singing, in fact. Here, he actually considers us to be a, the rich inheritance he provides himself. Listen, he wills us to himself since we are his treasured possession. That is a reality for all of us. But even if we take the other side of the debate, that is as glorious as well. They would explain that Paul is saying that God is providing heaven's riches to us in our spiritual poverty. This would mean that all the resources of heaven, all the resources of God are our inheritance. His mercy, his providence, his provision, his promise, eternal life, are all ours to claim because he is our father. God provides us the treasures of heaven, whatever is needed, to fulfill his purposes in our lives. The riches of God are of sure inheritance, and therefore we can leverage our estate against the present trials and sufferings and challenges that we experience, knowing that they are not greater than what God will provide for us. Practically then, we, when we experience trials, when we experience brokenness, when we experience death, we do not need to despair and lose hope or fear. The Spirit gives us eyes to see beyond this world and to heaven itself to know the provision that is certainly ours. Either way you see this inheritance, the message remains the same that God treasures us for we are recipients of his inheritance or that he's given us this inheritance, but it secures the reality that we are God's children in Christ. Paul prays that you would be filled with the spiritual wisdom and discernment that we find in God's word. He prays that you may know the hope of your calling. He prays that you may experience an inheritance that you have given by God or that you're God's inheritance. But he also then prays that we know and experience the greatest of God's power. Look at verses 19 through 23. 
Listen to these words. Hold on to these words. Be impacted by these words. Listen to what he says. These are God's words to us this morning. And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things in the church, which is the body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Paul is convinced that God's power is more than sufficient to live as his child when we face all kinds of trials and temptations and challenges. Paul prays that we would know the greatness of the power, God's power, the power that we have in Christ, the immeasurable greatness of that power in us. See, because of Christ's death, reign, and headship, we have the power, all the power that we need to live out the grace of the gospel in a very messy world. God's death and his ascension were decisive demonstrations of God's power. Listen to what John Stott wants us to consider. He says this, if there are two powers which man cannot control, which hold him in bondage, they are death and evil. Man is mortal, he cannot avoid death. Man is fallen, he cannot overcome evil. But God in Christ, listen, but God in Christ has conquered both, therefore can rescue us from both. But God in Christ has conquered both and therefore can rescue us from both. So we see that the church has power over death and we see that in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It says that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. Death is a bitter and relentless enemy. You know, this, this last couple weeks, I've experienced people that I've known in our lives that have experienced the loss of a husband at a very young age. All of us probably here have experienced death one way or another through the death of a friend or a family. We will one day experience it ourselves. No power, human power can prevent death, let alone bring a dead person back to life. God has done what no man or human could do. He raised Jesus from the dead. And we should say hallelujah, hallelujah. right? Because God arrested the, national, the natural process of decay, decay, refusing to allow his Holy One to see corruption. He also, by restoring G the dead Jesus to life, he transcends it. He raised Jesus to an altogether new life, immortal, glorious, free, which nobody had ever experienced before, which nobody has experienced since, not yet. See, God demonstrated great power in what he accomplished in Christ. The power then is available to all who are in Christ. We do not have to fear death. Christ's power accomplished a new life for us with him forever. We today, if you are in Christ, have this resurrected power. God, who raised Christ from the dead, lives in you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. But not only does the church have power over death, the church has power over evil. And we see that in verse 21 because of Jesus' enthronement. It says, for above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name, and that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come, the one to come. God promoted Jesus to a place of supreme authority and exclusive honor and authority. The power that is at work here on our behalf is a sovereign power that places Jesus, our advocate, our savior, above all rulers and forces of this world. To explain this, the sovereign power, Paul outlines virtually every dimension of authority and strength that we would recognize in the world, from political rule to physical might to spiritual forces in this age and the age to come. Paul says simply, Jesus is greater than them all. 
Jesus is greater than political power and rule. Jesus is greater than physical might. Jesus is greater than the spiritual forces of this age and the age to come. Practically, this means then that we, we, the church, then have Christ's power over sin and evil. God rules and reigns over all things and has victory over sin and evil. Bringing in Christ means that we have the power to fight sin and evil that confronts us in our lives. No matter what you may be facing, no matter you're tempted to compromise or tempted to give in to the, to, um, to the challenges of this world, let, let me remind you that Jesus, Jesus Christ lives in you and you have the power over evil. As a church, we have the power over evil collectively. And lastly, we see this power experience in this, that the church is filled with Jesus. And we see that in Jesus' headship in verses 22 and 23. He put all things under his feet and gave him head over all things to, to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Here we see God's power expressed in Christ's headship and the filling, up, filling us up in the church. Again, Jesus is over all things. All things is mentioned twice in verse 22. In the context, in the context embrace not only the material universe, but also and especially all intelligent beings, good and evil, angelic, demonic, the universe, and these beings, Christ rules. See, Jesus is not just head over, over all, not just head over all things, but he gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. For whom God gave to the church, one said, to be at his head was already head of the universe. God's universe and the church have in Jesus Christ the same head. As head of the church, Jesus fills the church, his body. As the church is filled by Christ, listen to this. I just love this. As the church is filled by Christ, we fill all creation. We fill all creation as representatives of Christ. Do you hear that? Because of all the spiritual blessings that we have found in Christ in chapter 1, and because Christ is head of the church, head of the universe, he now fills us, and we are now his representatives to a world which needs to see Christ. And as we fill the world, we then become a blessing to the world. See, this power is not merely for individuals, but for the church as a whole. Listen to what Chapel says. He says, we cannot fathom the magnitude of the apostles' promise that Christ, who is head over all things, is filling creation with his purpose for the church. The universe is being constrained in its course, bent in new directions, for the good of the bride of Christ. As much as our perceptions may seem to deny this truth, the battles rages, the leaders that rise, the events that occur, listen, do not thwart God's agenda. History relentlessly marches forward towards triumph of the church of Jesus Christ. He is using all things, including the tragedies of a fallen world, to shape and reshape the world for her sake. The whole creation is, giving, is being conformed. Listen, the whole creation is being conformed to purposes that serve the glory of Christ's church. You see, Christ delights to use the church as his instrument to fill up the earth with his eternal purposes. Friends, think about that. We have the power that resides in us. We have Christ and his power to make a difference in this world for good. His power put us in Christ to make us alive. Now living in Christ, we put on his power as we know and trust him. The power in Christ makes all the difference. The power made everything exist. The power that raised Jesus from the dead and also raised us from the dead and remade us his workmanship. This power works within us. We have Christ's power then to forgive. 
that person who sinned against you. You can forgive that person because of Christ who resides in you. That person that you need reconciliation with, you can pursue reconciliation because you have Christ's power that enables you to pursue reconciliation. You can, in fact, live sacrificially because you have Christ's power that lives within you that enables you to live sacrificially. You can flee temptation over sin and evil because you have the Christ power that resides in you. You can be kind and loving, bold and humble because you have Christ's power that lives and resides in you. Amen. Whatever situation that you find difficult in your life, Remember, if you're in Christ, you have his power that resides in you and then enables you then to live the way that he's called you to live. This prayer of Paul is completely astonishing. In Christ, we are given spiritual wisdom and discernment. We can know God through his word. He prays that we, are, that we would hold on to that hope. He prays that we would just dwell and, and be enriched knowing that we are God's possession, his treasured possession. He wants us to know the power that we have in Christ to live the life that he's called us to live. And he wants us to, as a church, to experience his grace as we then live in this world, filling this community in which we live, Germantown, Montgomery County. And as we fill this county, that they too, others who may not know Christ, that they would experience, that their hearts would be enlightened, that they would see the truth of the gospel, that they would see Jesus and all who he is and all that he's done and what he all continues to do in and through his church, us. May that be our prayer for one another. Let us pray. Precious God, I do pray this prayer. First, I do want to thank you for each one here. I thank you for the faith that you've given them in Christ. Father, I'm even thankful for those who may not yet put their faith in Christ. I thank you that they have come here today, that, they have, that their, ear, their ears would hear and their, their eyes would see the beauty of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful for the love that I see experienced here in this church. I thank you that how you have brought many nations here and how you're doing a work of grace among us. I'm thankful for that. Continue to do that work because we are in process. We don't do it perfectly. We fail, we blow it. We sin against one another. But yet, Father, we know that you are at work in us to make us more and more this beautiful bride that you've called us to be. And Father, I pray for all of us here as a church collectively that we would be um, filled and uh, that you would give us the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of you. That we, ha we would have our eyes enlightened that, so that we may know what is the hope to which we have been called. That we would know and experience the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. That we would know the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the great working of his great might that he worked in Christ, that he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. We know when we pray this prayer, it's not in vain because these are your very words you want us to pray for one another within the church. Lord, may your will be done. Even as I say that, let us now pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debt as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and sing to our great Lord. To him be the glory. Great things he has
Glory to God for all the rich graces that he provides to us in Christ. He has lavished grace upon grace, not only for us to know it, but to experience in our lives. May we be committed to praying to one another this powerful prayer, I encourage you. Now, brothers and sisters, love with faith from God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with you all who love our Lord Jesus with love incorruptible. Go in peace. Amen.